Hello. Who's here? That's yours, Colonel. Thank you. Mr. Fisher, another whiskey. Thank you. Well, you can get me one, Kathleen. Then come and sit by me to change my luck. Oh, stop talking. I'm trying to play this hand. Mm, the sort of hands you hold play themselves. Eh, hey, Colonel Henslow? Ronnie holds the most amazing cards. Oh, the rest are mine. I suppose because I'm your brother, Kathleen, I can't have a drink. That's right. Four spades. <clears throat> Yes, right. There's a bad effort on my part. Dr. Watson is here, miss. He says he won't disturb the bridge. Thank you, Martin. Tell him I'll be with him in a moment. Thank you. Yes, it's good. Dummy, of course, you had the opportunity of coming in. Well, now, what about Oliver? Uh, four in one hand and one in the dummy at 81. Excuse me, sir. This was on the floor. Uh, thanks. <coughs> ah, thank you. Uh, my dear, I believe. Will you cut, Carlo? Come and sit by me, Kathleen. I can't leave Dr. Watson alone. I must go. Mm. Is that the Dr. Watson, the friend of Sherlock Holmes? Yes. Then you know Holmes? No. Dr. Watson has known us since Ronnie and I were kids. But we've never met Mr. Holmes. Oh. He's always too busy. I see. I've got two aces of spades. But we've used this pack before. Oh, I know. Marston found one on the floor. Yes, but how could yes, it? And it must have dropped off here. You are cut, please, Carla. Cut for me, Ronnie. Well... Oh, don't go, Kathleen. I'll come and say goodnight to you all before I go to bed. I expect you'll all be at it till three. <clears throat> now, don't get up. I hope you all win. My dear, how kind of you to come. A summons from you comes before even a summons from Sherlock Holmes. It's sweet of you to say so, anyhow. Take off your coat and let me give you a drink. No, thanks. I can't stay. I came for a moment because you sent for me. Well, let's sit down for a minute. Ah. 
Has Ronnie got another bilious attack? No. It's nothing, really. I'm a bit worried. Kathleen, dear, won't you confide in me? It's about Ronnie. This gambling. You know, six months ago, we hadn't a shilling. You mean when your trustee absconded and shot himself? Yes. We were going to leave here. Ronnie was going to give up the diplomatic service. And then he began to play bridge for high stakes. But I always understood he was an exceedingly fine player. He is. But you can't always win. What do you mean? Always. Sometimes it's 20 pounds, sometimes 500. But he never loses. It looks as if... Oh, I can't say it. It's impossible. Ronnie isn't capable of such a thing. But I would like to be sure. How can one make sure? Well, I really don't know. I'll ask Holmes. Oh, no. He might arrest Ronnie. Oh, of course he wouldn't. But he might frighten him into giving up cards. I never thought of that. Yes. Do ask him to do something. I'll come round and see him in the morning, may I? Well, I don't know. Yes, I may. You'll make him see me, won't you? He thinks an awful lot of you. Well, I don't think I need waste time. It's a grand slam. I make seven spades, three diamonds, two hearts, and the ace of clubs. That's right. Another big rubber. Well, that just about cleans me up. Oh, I make the difference. Sixteen hundred points. You add up very quickly. Quite a mathematician, eh? <laughs> How much is that? A hundred and sixty pounds. Well, I've lost both rubbers, and so I owe you two hundred and fifty-five pounds. But we settle up at the end. This is the end. My, uh, my wife is not very well, and I promised to go home early. Well, if you must, you must. Uh, I'm sorry to spoil your evening, but perhaps you can get Miss Adair to make up a four. Kathleen plays a game that resembles hockey more than bridge. Still, if you are determined, we'll see you Monday. I'm afraid I shan't be able. I have to go out of town on important business, and I don't know when I shall be back. Then it's no use trying to fix another evening. I'm afraid not. Let me know when you're back. Good night. And thanks very much. I didn't know Sir Timothy played bridge. Sir Timothy? Yes. Timothy Frobisher. He's the fourth. You know, one can't work long with Sherlock Holmes without picking up some of his tricks of observation and deduction. What makes you think he's here? Well, his initials. T.F. Timothy Frobisher. Elementary, my dear Kathleen, elementary. And then, there are further indications. The owner of this hat is immensely tall. You see, he's bruised the top edge here, probably going through a door. Excuse me, may I have my hat? Yours? Certainly. My initials are inside. T.F. Thomas Fisher. Oh, I beg your pardon. You're not going? Yes, my wife is not very well, and I promise to get home early. Oh, I am sorry. I think I'll go, too. Well, good night, and thanks for playing. Sorry, you had such rotten luck. See you Monday. Well, really, I, I think I'd better not. I've lost an awful lot lately, and I think I'd better chuck it for a bit. Well, just as you like. Oh, don't think me rude, but, but I just can't afford it. That's all right, everybody. Good night, Colonel. Good night. Well, have you to have a sick wife and a business appointment? No. A whiskey and soda. I'm sorry. Still, it is rather rotten. I don't see why. Fisher, being a millionaire, naturally loses his temper when he loses sixpence. And Tony Rutherford is broke. And you think that's all? What else? Oh, nothing, of course. You can always get another four. Then you'll continue to come. With pleasure. I'm not afraid of losing sixpence, and I'm lucky. I often cut with you. <laughs> What's the matter with you all, stopping so early? Well, Fisher had to go, and for once in my life, I'm going to have an early night. <laughs> and I'll see you out. Good night, Ronnie. Good night, Colonel.
Ronnie. You've got to tell me the truth. The truth? What do you, what do you mean? I've got to find out the truth. A terribly difficult thing, darling. Ronnie, stop. Can't explain the ace of spades. Explain the ace of spades? You know exactly what I mean. When Marston picked it up, you said it belonged to that cat. It doesn't, and you know it. Well, it must belong to some other cat. A hidden duplicate pack. What the devil do you mean? How dare you suggest it? God knows I don't want to suggest it. But we were ruined. Then you started playing bridge for high stakes. Look here, and... Kathleen. We've always been the best of pals. But if you're going to say things like that, I... Don't you see? Everything points to it. Oh, I don't believe it. I, I won't believe it. If I did... I'd rather put a bullet through your head than earn a brother. Oh, yes, ma'am. Excuse me, sir. A note from the Foreign Office. Thanks. Who brought it? A commissioner, sir. Is he there? No, sir. He said there would be no answer. Thanks. Shall you want anything else, sir? Uh, not tonight, Marston. I shall want breakfast a bit earlier. The foreign and craft may help us tonight. Very good, sir. Good night, please. Good night, Marston. Good night, sir. Good night. Anything serious? Well, if you must know, they want me to go and see some German fellow in Hampstead who will tell me some official secret which was probably published in last night's paper. Don't go, Ronnie. I've got to have this out with you. I can't believe. Ronnie. What shall I do with Mr. Holmes's breakfast? Isn't he up yet? I ain't no sign of him. Hasn't even took in his shaving water. I do wish he'd be a bit more regular in his habit. Meals at all times of the day, does turn the house upside down. But you know, Mrs. Hudson, you always insist on keeping his meals for him. He never asks. <laughs> yes, but the poor man must eat sometimes. If I didn't see that he had a bite now and again, it'd have been in his grave years ago. I should go and bang on his door. Oh, yes, sir. But sometimes when he's thinking out his problems, he's that cross when he's disturbed. He won't be this morning. He's rather good tempered. And he doesn't want any breakfast. No, Mr. Holmes. You did give me a turn. Well, uh, one good turn deserves another. <laughs> What can I do for you? Uh, some breakfast, sir. Oh, I've, I've already breakfasted with the manager of the London and Commercial Bank. Oh, so they've sent for you for this. Mm. Are you sure I can't tempt you to a nice bit of addict? My dear Mrs. Hudson, you've always been a temptation to me. <laughs> but addict, after a good breakfast, is not. No, uh, you do carry on. It's a good job I don't take you serious. Oh, I'm perfectly serious. Jokes are not my strong point. Ask the doctor. <laughs> I never see any of his. No. You know, I've been wondering, my dear Watson, why you don't get the batteries of your car recharged. What do you mean? Well, you had great difficulty in getting your car to start last night. The batteries are run down. They are, but how did you know? <clears throat> you've a blister at the base of your fingers on the right hand. As you've not been sculling on the serpentine this morning, I deduced that you've been cranking your car. That's rather wonderful. <laughs> That's, uh, that's elementary, my dear Watson. Elementary. 
Oh, let me give you a hand. Thank you, sir. Can you lift that? Yes. And the cloth on the top. Yes, please. There you are. Thank you. Are you sure there's nothing else I can do for you? No, nothing, thank you. Oh, wait a minute. Let me give you a hand. Why have they sent for you about this? It's perfectly simple. A man tries to burgle a bank, is disturbed, kills the watchman and runs away. I find it very interesting. Hmm. Have you ever heard of Professor Robert Moriarty? No. What's he got to do with it? Oh, he's to do with half the crimes the world over. <laughs> he started as a mathematical professor. But ugly rumours gathered round him, and he resigned. So after that, he vanished for ten years or so. I fancy he went abroad. Then he returned to England, and things began to happen. What thing? For a long time, I've been conscious of some power, a deep organization which stands in the way of the law. Once he made a slip, and I was able to deduce that behind that power was Moriarty. But he recovered himself, and I could prove nothing. He has hundreds of agents, none of whom have ever seen him. Sometimes an agent is caught. But the man who plans most of the crimes that are committed is never caught, never even suspected. He knows that I know of his activities. He also knows that up to now, I've been unable to reach him. And you think he's connected with this bank murder? I think it highly probable. Yes? Yes, come in. Inspector Lestrade, this evening, Oh, ah, oh, Lestrade. Anything fresh? No, Mr. Holmes. Sit down, Lestrade. Thank you. I just came in to get that piece of brown paper. Oh, yes, yes, this little piece. You mean, I should like to keep it a little longer, if I may. I haven't yet decided what the rest of the label is. Well, uh, I don't see how you ever can. Mm. It's just an ordinary shopkeeper's label. There's not enough of it to tell us anything. Uh, well, I disagree, my dear Lestrade. Uh, but then uh, you and I so often disagree. Oh, come, Mr. Holmes. I have a great respect for your theories. It's only when you begin about this Professor Moriarty. Yeah, you don't believe in him. I ask you, is it possible for a man to plan half the crime in this country without the yard knowing who he is, where he lives, or anything about him? He does seem rather strange. I mean, the man can't live nowhere and never be seen by anyone. Of course. I mean, lots of people know him, but they don't know that he's Moriarty. Mm, you yourself may know him. Jokes are not your strong point, Holmes. No, I'm perfectly serious. He has a hundred disguises and a hundred aliases. And I'm pretty certain he had a hand in this bank robbery. But it wasn't a robbery. The thief got nothing. He broke into the bank and... and... Have you ever tried to break into a bank, Lester? Yeah. Me? <laughs> no, I thought not. But do you seriously think it possible for one man to break into a bank without using anything short of dynamite? There were no signs of a forced entry. Which might point to the fact of his having an accomplice. Or even two. He got inside. Which doesn't necessarily mean your professor. The man was interrupted by the watchman, killed him, got frightened and bolted. And yet... Inside the safe, we found this piece of brown paper. Three people swear it was not there when the safe was shut last night. Then he was inside when he was disturbed. Or before he went inside. He had this paper wrapped round something. You will observe that this end here is slightly torn and there is a, a blood stain on it. I therefore deduce that the struggle with the watchman took place first. And he then took his parcel into the safe. Oh, it won't work, Mr. Holmes. It won't work. There were 70,000 pounds of notes in the vault. Not one of them is missing. How true. How true. But if you remember, a fortnight ago, an almost similar thing occurred in Berlin. In Berlin? Yes. <laughs> you should read your Berliner Tageblatt, my dear Lestrade. The strong room of the Reichsbank was entered. 
The watchman was laid out, happily not killed, and nothing was removed. Very strange, Mr. Holmes. Very strange indeed. It looks almost as if there was a connection. I should like time to think it out a bit. Uh, when can I have that piece of brown paper? I I'll let you have it this evening. In the meantime, would you be good enough to warn all foreign customs officials to be on the lookout for a very large quantity of English bank notes which will be smuggled through in ordinary luggage? What do you think? I think it would be a wise precaution. Very good, Mr. Holmes. I'll get back to the yard now and put the matter in hand. Good morning, gentlemen. The chief has arrived, sir. Oh? What are his orders? He will interview Mr. Adair himself. Right. Send Mr. Adair in. What the devil's the meaning of this? Adair. Adair. My God, am I drunk or what? I hope not at 10 o'clock in the morning. What's all this about? I was seized in a car, blindfolded, and driven half around London. I apologize for that. It was just a slight precaution. And you must forgive me concealing my identity behind the sleeping cardinal. Please sit down. Are you Mr... Mr. Clink? Mr. Otto Clink? No. Poor Otto Clink must have been dead a good many years. What the devil's the meaning of this? Only that I have a slight favor to ask of you, Mr. Adair. A favor? Who are you, anyway? I understand that you are leaving on the Golden Arrow at 11 o'clock tomorrow for Paris. And if I am? You are going on foreign office business. And you will have a lacy passé. Which means that your luggage will not be examined by the customs. I want you to take a suitcase to Paris for me. I'll do nothing of the kind. Why should I? Because you can't help yourself. Don't be ridiculous. Sit down, Adair. You go to hell. Sit down. You have been cheating at cards. What? I repeat, you have been cheating at cards. I should have warned you that this picture is painted on steel. Sit down. All your life you have been interested in sleight of hand. Your trick of farming a whole pack of cards has been very useful to you since your trustee absconded and left you and your sister penniless. It's a lie. You have taken to playing bridge for very high stakes. When you deal, you simply change the pack after it has been cut to you. You have a carefully prepared pack in the palm of your hand. You do the same when you cut a pack to your opponent. Now, this procedure, if publicly known, is not likely to lead to an advancement either social or diplomatic. In fact, it means the end of you. Who's been telling you this ridiculous story? Last night you made a slip. You dropped the ace of spades. Now I think I can count on your doing me this very slight service. 
suitcase bearing your initials will be delivered at your flat at 9.30 this evening. You will pass it through the customs with your other luggage. I understand you have engaged a room at the Bristol in Paris. You will take your luggage there. And by 10 o'clock tomorrow night, the suitcase will have vanished from your room. You will make no comment. What's in this precious suitcase? That does not concern you. Yes, but it might be anything. Stolen jewels, bombs, heaven knows what. No, I'll be damned if I'll be made use of in this way. I feel sure that you will change your mind. In the event of your not doing so, you will find the only alternative in the box on the table. What do you mean? Here. Come back, whoever you are. What do you mean? The only alternative. Oh, my God. What are you trying to do? I'm trying to see how many Bank of England notes will go into a parcel of this size. You see, my dear Watson, that this uh, note should fit into these creases. There you are, as I thought exactly. Yes. Were you busy this morning, Watson? No, I kept the morning free. I rather hoped you'd see Kathleen Adair. She's due here now. I sent her a note on the way home from the bank. Oh, that's very kind of you. But then you'll have a talk to Ronnie. Uh, no, I want to talk about it. He's in the uh, diplomatic service, isn't he? Yes. But what's that got to do with it? What's what got to do with what, Watson? Come in. Mr. Dare to see you, sir. How wonderful of you to have managed it. It's terribly kind of you to see me. Not at all. Won't you sit down? The Watsons told me how worried you are about your brother, but I don't quite see what I can do. I've been wondering if you could find out if it's really true. If it is. And I can't believe that it is. Perhaps you could frighten him into giving up cards. For whom does he play as a rule? Well, last night there was Tony Rutherford, old Mr. Fisher. What, Thomas Fisher, the millionaire? Yes. And Colonel Henslow, an old friend of ours. Mm -hmm. Fisher, I wonder... Forgive me, Mr. Dare, but does your brother travel at all on official business? Quite a lot. In fact, he's off to Paris tomorrow. Ah, I thought so. How long has he known that he would be going tomorrow? Three or four days, I think. Where is your brother at the moment? I don't know. At the Foreign Office by now, I should think. He went out early this morning. They sent a car for him. Oh, do you happen to know uh, where he had to go? I think he said Hampstead. I know it wasn't far. He should be back at the office by now. Yes. Yes, they think a great deal of your brother at the foreign office. They used to. But lately he's been paying so much bridge. I'm afraid he's been neglecting his work. Yes, that's a pity. Yes, I wonder if you'd be good enough to ask your brother to come and see me this afternoon. Of course. I'll go round to the foreign office now. Oh. I might just catch him. Why not telephone? He hates being long up there and I couldn't explain on the telephone. What shall I do if I miss him? Well, when will you be seeing him? Tonight. He's dining out and he's bound to come in to dress. Very well. In that case, would you be good enough to ask him to come and see me in the morning before he starts? That's awfully kind of you. Uh, don't mention bridge to it. As a matter of fact, I shall not say a word on that subject myself. But you may rest assured that after he has seen me, he will never gamble again. I can't tell you how grateful I am. Not at all. It's I am grateful to you. Watson. Yes? What's all this mean, Holmes? Means, my dear Watson, 
that the Foreign Office doesn't send a car to take a very unimportant young man to Hepstead. Hello? Hello? Yes, speaking. Well, who's that? Mrs. Smith. I seem to know that name. Mrs. Annie Smith. Oh, Mrs. Tallboy has put you on to me. I don't think I know her, Mrs. Tallboy. Huh? <laughs> no, you're quite right. It doesn't matter. Oh, you think it's appendicitis? Oh, what's the address? Would you mind taking this down, Holmes? 1006 Fentonville Road. Yes. Yes, I'll come at once. I'll take a taxi. Goodbye. Here's the address. I've added a note which I want you to read when you've found the taxi. What's it about? Well, you read it when you've found the taxi. I hope your friend, Mrs. Tallboy's friend, is not as bad as she thinks. Oh, what is it? Please, Mother says, can I have Carl's pajamas? They've blown up our line into your backyard. You've no right to hang out your washing and your whatnots in a respectable neighborhood like this. Mother said, if you started carrying on about the washing, I wasn't to stand any of your lips. Your mother said that? Yes, she did. Well, I never had such impudence in all my born days. You go and I'll give your mother lip. You wait. Mother said, I'll take that pajamas and not to talk to you. She doesn't think you're respectable. What's that? She says it's disgraceful, a widow living in a house full of nothing but men. Oh, you wait a minute. I'll give her respectable. Go on up it. Go on up your bell. Oh, my word, respectable. Yes? Come in. Hello. Yes? Sir. Hmm? I'm just going to step around to that Mrs. Freeman. I've got a few things I want to say to her. Yes, Mrs. Hudson. But what has upset you? Well, she just told me. She sent her daddy's round to say that I... Well, I want to mean myself for saying what she did say. But I want you to know I shall be out 20 minutes. Well, I wouldn't be too violent if I were you, Mrs. Hudson. Violent? <laughs> Indeed, I'll set about a good and prop. Indeed, I would, if it wasn't for my chronic answeritis. <laughs> Come in, Professor. You think you know me, Mr. Holmes? Why not? You called upon me once before. On that occasion, your face was completely covered with surgical bandages. But your arrival coincided with the same removal of Watson and Mrs. Hudson. You were a little more original in your methods last time. The day I recognized the symptoms. I was expecting you, Moriarty. How clever of you, Holmes. Yes, yes. Won't you take off your scarf, Professor? Yes, perhaps you're right. This room is rather drafty. Shall we sit down? I'm afraid my method of getting rid of Watson and Mrs. Hudson was a trifle crude. But I had a sudden impulse, and uh, anyhow, it served its purpose. Except that our interview will be a brief one. 
Watson will have read my note in the taxi, telling him to ignore the call and come back here in five minutes. In that case, I will be brief. On the 4th of May, 1928, you crossed my path. A dangerous thing to do, Holmes. Eight months later, to be exact, the 20th of January, 1929, you incommoded me seriously. Yes, yes you made a bad slip in 1929, didn't you? Nearly had you, Professor. And now I find you so constantly in my way that it would be better for me if you were uh, removed. Perhaps what I have to say has already crossed your mind. Possibly my answer may have crossed yours. You stand fast? Absolutely. A great pity, Holmes. I have a great respect for your mentality. A great pity. You are getting in the way of a great organization, the full extent of which even you, with all your cleverness, cannot realize. You wish to put me in the dock. You never will. If you destroy me, rest assured I shall do as much for you. That's very interesting, Professor, but your five minutes are up. I fancy I hear the arrival of Watson. Uh, may I offer you a piece of advice? Never give way to sudden impulses. They're even more dangerous to you than I am. <laughs> I read your note, Holmes. I... Oh, I beg your pardon. Uh, did you come to see me? Your friend is in great danger. <laughs> great danger. <laughs> What's the matter with him? It is, it is the draft, Watson. He's feeling the draft very badly at this moment. But who was it? Well, that was Mrs. Smith of 1006 Pentonville. Mrs. Or shall we say, Professor. Oh, <laughs> the mythical Moriarty. Oh. What does he look like? Well, I know no more than you do. Except that the first molar in the left side of the upper jaw is very badly filled with gold. <laughs> Have you a mathematical mind, Watson? I think so, fairly. Ah. Well, never give way to sudden impulses. They're not good for mathematicians. Moriarty has made the worst slip he's made since January 1929. You mean you think you found out how to get him? Uh, no. No, I found out where he gets his boots. I wish you'd be serious. The, the professor's boots? are made by Mr. J.J. Godfrey, bootmaker. Yes, here we are. 502 Pont Street, Southwest West 1. Godfrey, Pont Street. Yes. But that's where I have mine made. You do surprise me. But Godfrey's yes. a perfectly respectable tradesman with a high-class clientele. Well, obviously. Obviously, you and Moriarty, you share a bootmaker with the professor. For all I know, he may be a great friend of yours. Oh, really? <laughs> does, uh, does Mr. Godfrey make his boots on the premises? Yes, in the basement. Mm. He showed me over his workshop once. Yes. <clears throat> I think I'd like to see over that workshop. Hmm? We'll arrange with Lestrade to call there about 8 o'clock tonight. But how can it possibly matter where Moriarty buys his boots? Only that this piece of brown paper, which was found in the strong room of the bank, bears a piece of the label of Mr. J.J. J. Godfrey, bootmaker. Holmes, you're marvellous. Oh, elementary, my dear Watson.
Well, that's that. Now, what am I to do with it? You will be at Down Street Tube Station at 9 o'clock precisely. You'll take the suitcase with you. Oh, it's all right. There's heaps of time. It isn't 8 o'clock yet. In the main entrance, you'll see a man with a scar on his left temple. He will take the suitcase from you. Yes, sir. The keys... Hello, sir. Looks a good bit of work. Yes, sir. I'm a good workman. <laughs> Moran. Well, the chief's here. I have just been informed that Inspector Lestrade has left Scotland Yard in a powerful car with police constables number 47, 54, and 83, all of the C Division. They will doubtless call for Sherlock Holmes and that great detective, Dr. Watson. Don't attempt to hide the suitcase. It would look suspicious. And see that everything is tidy. If the police detain you, I have arranged for someone else to take the suitcase. Come in here, Moran. You heard? Yes, sir. That's right, Godfrey, will you? All right, sir. Which of you is Mr. Godfrey? I am. There's my search warrant. Search warrant? Well, what are you searching for? You'll know when I found it. Why? If it isn't Dr. Watson. Hope the last pair of shoes I made were satisfactory. Oh, I see you're wearing them now. Yes, quite, thanks. I say, Holmes. But this does seem rather absurd. You know, Godfrey's made my shoes for years. Yes, your shoe last is in that cupboard over there now. Over there? Yes. I'll go and find it. I suppose, Godfrey, you know what we've come for. I haven't the slightest idea. Hello. Starting out a new branch, eh? Who's that? Yes, that, that's an experiment. Special order for a new customer. Thought I might as well try my hand at it. I'm glad to see you look after your work people, Godfrey. Oh. Well, up. Uh, have only got three of them. Hmm. There's Roberts and Williams and his brother here. Yeah. Mm. Well, you, you, you look after them. The yes. place is properly ventilated. Ventilated? Oh, that. I yes, sir. Yeah. Oh, yes, a ventilator. Where's that door lead? To the area. But uh, as you can see, it, it hasn't been open for years. Well, I should like you to open it. Heaven only knows where the key is. That door hasn't been open since I... I don't know when. Oh. Godfrey, this is a curious looking... What do you use for? It's used for special work. Oh. Sit 
So, you wanted to know what I was looking for, Godfrey. Well, you know now. I was looking for a press that made perfect Bank of England notes. Take them all away. What are you doing? Quick, follow this wire. Let's go. What for? Uh... Oh, quickly, let's go. Help me get this door now. Another drink, my dear Watson. Hey, you feel better. Thanks, I'm all right. I haven't a scratch. It's a bit of a shock being seized and trussed up like that. Hmm. You saw nobody? Nothing. I was standing in the cupboard, and the shelves swung round. I was seized from behind and blindfolded. Hmm. Well, anyway, we've done a good night's work. My theory of the bank robbery is proving correct. What is your finding of Forger's outfit in a bootmaker's basement got to do with a bank robbery? which wasn't a robbery at all. <clears throat> well, I'll try to explain. Within a fortnight, the strong rooms of two banks are entered by unauthorized persons and nothing is removed. But in each case, something is taken into the strong room. In the case of the Reichsbank, a cardboard box. In the case of the commercial, a piece of brown paper. Well, they wanted to take the notes away in them. The brown paper had been uh, creased and folded round something. Well? Mr. Godfrey's printing press makes perfect Bank of England notes. Now, supposing they have an accomplice who gives them the numbers of the notes in stock. They make duplicates. Probably perfect duplicates if my friend Moriarty has anything to do with it. They change these for the real one. Now, the forgeries have to arrive at the bank uncreased and spotless. Hence the brown paper. But the real ones can be taken away anyhow, stuffed in the pockets, anything. And the paper discarded. The robbery will not be discovered until two notes of the same number arrive at the Bank of England. And the longer that event is postponed, the better. So what does my learned friend do? Well, uh, holds them up. No, no, my dear Watson, no, no. It's no use having 70,000 pounds worth of notes if you don't use them. Well, then he must start circulating. Uh -huh, or send them abroad. Uh, well, that sounds difficult. You see, customs officials might ask questions mm. if they opened a trunk full of Bank of England notes. Yeah. Yeah, how true, Watson, how true. Well, in any case, I don't feel I've been trussed up for nothing. It was worth it to find that printing press. The printing press, my dear Watson, was valuable to get your friend Mr. Godfrey a term of penal servitude. But the really important discovery was the suitcase. Suitcase? You probably didn't observe that on the lid were the initials R.A. I didn't, but what does that signify? Mm -hmm. Ronald Adair is leaving tomorrow morning for Paris on foreign office business. He will have a diplomatic passport and a laissez-passe, which means that his luggage will not be examined. But, well, you, you can't connect him with... Good heavens, you don't think he's one of the gang? Supposing Moriarty were to threaten to expose his bridge exploit. How should Moriarty know? Well, how do I know things? What time is it, Watson? It's a quarter to eleven. Oh. Well, I wonder if, if we could get hold of Adair now. Oh, I forgot to tell you. Hmm? Miss Adair sent a message to say that she'd missed her brother at the foreign office and that she'd sent him round in the morning. Ah, well, will you ring up now, Watson? Will you and see if we can get hold of him right away? Yes, certainly. If I'm right, that young man is the one weak spot in Moriarty's armour. If I can get hold of him, Moriarty's wrong. He will stand in the dock tomorrow, and not long after, on the gallows. Mr. Adair! Mr. Adair! 
Sveče? Sveče! Hello. Yes. Yes. You can't, sir. You can't. He's killed. Yes, I've just found him shot through the head. Is it usual for you to go to bed as early as ten o'clock? Yes, sir. When there's no company. And you heard nothing at all? No, sir. You, you see, our bedrooms are all at the back of the building. Completely cut off from the rest of the flat. I see. Yes, sir. Thank you. Would you send the butler to me? Yes, sir. You can go too. <laughs> but surely, Lestrade, considering what I've told you about the bridge party, it was obviously a case of suicide. Then where is the revolver? Well, he must have thrown it out of the window. Well, the bullet didn't penetrate the brain. He may have been conscious for a few seconds after the shot. And his fireplace shows that he'd been burning his correspondence. A good deal of correspondence. Then what about the letter he was writing? Oh, I can't make that out. The sleeping cardinal forced me to... I can't think what it means. Oh, Mr. Holmes. Would you care to examine the servants? The cook and the housemaid... Neither saw nor heard anything. No, 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 let's say. No, no, no. You carry on. No, I'll just amuse myself. And we found this on the table in front of him. The sleeping cardinal. The sleeping cardinal now. Where have I heard that name before? You're the butler here. Yes, sir. Have you been with the family long? Three years, sir. Then you know their ways. Did anything unusual occur here this evening? No, sir. Miss Adair dined alone at home, and uh, Mr. Adair came in at a quarter past nine with Colonel Henslow. Who is Colonel Henslow? Oh, he's an old friend of the family. He knew Ronnie Adair's father in India. Sir Henry Adair was Governor General of Bengal, you know. They used to hunt tigers together. Did you gather at all what they were talking about when they came in? Well, sir, Mr. Adair was saying, and you think Fisher means trouble? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was all I heard, sir. How long was the colonel here? Barely half an hour, sir. Was Miss Adair with him? No, sir. She was in her room. And was anyone else in the flat? No, sir. You are positive that there was no one else at all? No, sir. Oh, uh, a man came about half past nine with a new suitcase that Mr. Adair had ordered. What, uh, what kind of a man? I didn't notice him particularly, sir. He wasn't actually inside the flat. He just handed me the case and I signed for it. Where did the case come from? I really didn't notice, sir. I just told Mr. Adair it was here and he told me to put it with the other luggage in his bedroom. Oh. Which one? That's the odd thing, sir. It isn't here. And I can't find it anywhere, so I've searched the flat. It was quite an ordinary sort of case. I can't think where it could get hidden. But it must be somewhere. Unless Mr. Adair took it out. He didn't go out, sir. He went straight to his room after the colonel had left. Why didn't Miss Adair come and see the colonel? Wasn't she friendly with him? Oh, yes, sir. She was quite friendly with him. Wasn't she friendly with her brother? They were devoted to each other. They were, sir. But there was a bit of a shindy last night, sir. Well, she never mentioned anything about it to me. No, sir. It was after you and the other gentlemen had left. I can't think it was a serious quarrel. I beg pardon, sir. It was. I brought in a note for Mr. Adair, and I don't think they heard me come in. What were they saying? Well, sir, Miss Adair was very excited, and she said... I'd rather put a bullet through your head than own a brother who... And then she saw me and stopped. Directly afterwards, Mr. Adair left the room. And tonight, how did you know he'd been killed? The phone bell was ringing in this room, which was locked, and I got no answer to my knocking. What did you do? I broke down the door. And then I found Mr. Adair in that chair, lying across the table, dead. And the window open. How long had he been in his room? About half an hour, sir. 
And you heard nothing? Not a sound, sir. And I was in my pantry, which is on this side of the flat. Thank you, Master. Would you ask Mr. Dare to come here? Yes. I think if I were you, I should see Colonel Henslow first. I understand he's with Mr. Dare. And after all, he was the last person to see a dare alive. Yes. Will you ask the Colonel to come here? Very good, sir. Well, that disposes of your suicide theory. What do you mean? You're not suggesting that Miss Adair... At any rate, she threatened. But the door was locked on the inside. Ah, Colonel. I don't think you know Inspector Lestrade. And my friend Sherlock Holmes. Delighted to meet two such famous people. I also am delighted to meet such a distinguished big game hunter. <laughs> My hunting days are over. Yes, yes. There must be a great trial to you, of all people. Uh, was it the war? No. A tiger mauled my arm. It turned septic and had to be taken off at the shoulder. I'm lucky to be alive at all. Yes, I'm immensely ignorant about tiger hunting. Uh, tell me, you, you go out on elephants with beaters, don't you? Pardon me, Mr. Holmes. But I must ask the Colonel a few questions. It's all right, let's say, just a minute. I, I'm, I'm very interested in tiger hunting. Well, elephants and beaters are used when royalty and rajas hunt tigers. But they're expensive. Oh, very. You can always tether a goat and wait till the tiger comes for it. Really, Mr. Holmes, I'm pressed for time. And I must ask the Colonel a few questions. Yeah, well, fire ahead, Lester. Fire ahead. You were the last to see the deceased alive. Yes. You... He's been very nervous since last night. He came round this evening and asked me to come back with him for a chat. I suppose you all know what's happened at the bridge party. Yes. One of the players looked like being unpleasant. And Adair wanted my advice. And what was your advice? To do nothing at all. Even if it were true, nobody could prove it. And he was less worried when you left? I think he was. A little. I understand a new suitcase was brought to the house last night. Were you there when it arrived? I believe so. I never saw it. But I heard Ronnie tell Marson to take it into his bedroom. <gasps> what time did you leave? About uh, a quarter to ten. And within three quarters of an hour, he was found dead. Surely it's obvious he shot himself. I disagree, my dear Watson. He was murdered. Of course. You don't really think so? Yes, my dear Colonel. I'm certain of it. And what is more, I'm sure you'll all be glad to hear that within 24 hours... I shall not only be in a position to prove it, but I shall have the murderer under lock and key. I'm delighted to hear it. Not that it can bring the poor lad back. You know, Ronnie, with all his faults, was extraordinarily lovable. I feel rather as if I had lost a son. Thank you, Colonel Henslow. I shan't need you any more. Would you uh, mind asking Mr. Dare to come to me a moment? Certainly. Goodbye, Mr. Holmes. Goodbye, Colonel. I'm sorry I interrupted you, Mr. Holmes, but you seem so interested in tigers that I thought you were never going to stop. Mm, they interest me. The stark ferocity, the cold cruelty. Very human beings are they like tigers, you know. <laughs> Now I suppose you're back to your Moriarty theory. You're not going to try and tell me that this is his handiwork? Well, who knows? <laughs> that man has become an obsession with him. He is. He is. Mr. Dare, I want to offer you my very sincere sympathy. It was a ghastly shock to me. I can imagine what it must have been to you. I won't keep you a minute, Miss Adair. Won't you sit down? When did you last see your brother? At half past six. 
He came in to dress, and I came in here to give him a message. What was the message? I told him that Mr. Holmes wanted to see him before he went to Paris. You see, I'd asked Mr. Holmes to interview him. What did he say? He was upset. In fact, we had rather a quarrel about it. Another quarrel? You had one the night before. Yes, but this was not so serious. He was merely annoyed that I had spoken to Mr. Holmes. He was very annoyed? Well, rather. He seemed more frightened than annoyed. I couldn't understand. And so you quarreled again? Well, yes. He said I had no business to interfere in his affairs. And did you again threaten to shoot him? Shoot him? What do you mean? The night before, your butler heard you threatening him. Oh, no. I never did anything of the kind. I shoot Ronnie. You said you would rather put a bullet through his head than own a brother who... Oh, that was only a figure of speech. I was accusing him of something. A most unfortunate figure of speech, considering that within 24 hours he was found with a bullet through his head. But you don't think that No, I... miss. But I must ask you to come along with me after I've finished my investigation. I say, Lestrade, this is grotesque. Holmes, listen. Here's Lestrade suggesting that Miss Adele... No, Dr. Watson, I didn't. All I want is her to come along and make a statement. I'm sure Miss Adair will be delighted to go with you, Lestrade. <clears throat> it is quite a warm night. Anything you say, of course. Thanks, Miss. I shall be ready in a minute. Then I'll go and put on my things. If you have no more questions... No, nothing else, thanks. <clears throat> this is outrageous. Well, Mr. Holmes, what do you think? It's really remarkable how many varieties of trees there are in these London parks. Have you ever noticed what remarkably fine specimens... Really, Mr. Holmes, you're a most extraordinary man. In the middle of an investigation like this, you begin talking about trees. Holmes, you've heard Lestrade's ghastly accusation. Surely it was suicide. He burned his correspondence. I don't think he did. These are the ashes of, I should say, at least a dozen packs of playing cards. Because he was afraid Fisher was going to expose him. My dear Watson, as I've already told you, this was murder. Uh, and it was committed from outside this room. What? Shot through the keyhole? Hmm. <laughs> Ronald Adair burnt those playing cards and they caused a great deal of smoke. He opened the window and sat down to write that confession. And the moment he sat down, he was shot from outside. But how? From this height, you can hardly see the street. He would have had to have been hanging out of the window. And he wasn't. He was sitting in that chair. And you are suggesting that somebody stood in the middle of Park Lane between ten and a half past, and fired a rifle. It would have had to have been a rifle to carry as far as this. And that nobody saw or heard anything, though there must have been hundreds of passers-by. Yes, passers-by there undoubtedly were. But as you've doubtless already ascertained, there were no police about. I beg your pardon, Mr. Holmes. There are always police about. There were a couple on point duty at Stanhope Gate. I find on inquiry that Three separate disturbances occurred at precisely 10.15 in this neighborhood tonight. A lot of roughs who are not accustomed to frequent the public house round the corner refused to leave and were ejected by the police. A young woman drove a car into a lorry about a hundred yards up the road and there was a false alarm of fire in Harford Street. It's curious that all these things should have been absolutely simultaneous. But even supposing the police were occupied, you can't stand and fire a rifle into a Park Lane window without somebody having seen and heard something? How true. Do you know a hornbeam when you see one? A hornbeam? Mm. 
There are some remarkably fine specimens in the park. What is a horn being? The Latin name is Carpinus. They're common in the temperate zones of Asia and some parts of southern England. It, it looks like a beach, but it isn't. You know, Dr. Watson, in spite of the fact that I've known Holmes for some years, I sometimes wonder if he's all there. <laughs> Put this in your mouth for a few minutes. Hmm? What are you for? I don't think you're at all well. Oh, nonsense, my dear Watson, nonsense. I'm in the very best of health, in spite of a couple of nasty shocks. When did you have a shock? Well, I said two. During the stroll I took this afternoon, I was just going to cross the Marylebone Road. The policeman on point duty was holding up the traffic. When a two-horse van, apparently out of control, whizzed round the corner and was on me in a flash. I sprang to the pavement and saved myself by the fraction of a second. Good heavens, kid. Ten minutes later, a brick fell from the roof of the house. It was shattered at my feet. They were repairing the roof at the time, but the police proved it was an accident. <laughs> I know better. Oh, very nasty indeed. Oh. But these things happened this afternoon. I was worrying about you in the early hours of the morning. Mm -hmm. What did I do? Do? In the middle of a terribly serious conversation... You started talking about trees in the park and the difference between a hornbeam and a beach, altogether disconnected. And I thought uh, a little delirious. Yes, yeah. no, I, I did ramble a bit, didn't I? And I'm sorry you made what Lestrade called the bombastic statement uh -huh. that within 24 hours, 12 of which, by the way, are already gone, you would have the murderer. No, he wasn't at all like you, Holmes. No, no, he, he did look as if I were very ill, didn't he? He gives Lestrade such a chance to crow. He thinks he's done a frightful lot and you nothing. Mm -hmm. He's disposed of my suicide theory and, and made an arrest. Who? I, I wonder he hasn't arrested you or Mrs. Hudson. And he never stops talking about this mythical Moriarty. Now listen, my dear Watson. I have established to my own satisfaction that in both the Reichsbank and the commercial bank cases, forged notes were substituted for real ones. Well... Uh -huh. I have also established, to my own satisfaction, and through the missing suitcase, that Ronald Adair was to have taken those English notes to Paris. And the same brain that planned that scheme planned the removal of Ronald Adair. But why should they remove their means of getting the notes safely out of the country? Because Ronald Adair refused at the last minute. Why should he? He was still open to exposure as a cheat. That's what frightened him. He is. <laughs> but I frightened him still more. When his sister told him that I wanted to see him, he was panic-stricken, as he realized that his cheating could only result in scandal. The other meant certain jail. I see. And what did you make of that letter he was writing about the sleeping cardinal? Now, that, my dear Watson, is the most significant aspect of the case. Do you remember eight months ago when Trimble the Forger was found on the embankment dying from terrible injuries He, uh... Yes? Yes? Yeah. Yes. Yes, sir. Well, we mustn't forget your appointment. Appointment? Yes, it's necessary for me to remain alone a little while. So you, my dear Watson, are going to Euston. Euston? Whatever for? the idea. You'll see. You're going to have a busy night. Now, I want you to put on your coat and hat, take a suitcase. You needn't pack anything. Get a taxi and make a great fuss about getting it. Call Euston to the driver and tell him if he doesn't hurry, you'll miss the Scotch Express. 
The Scotch Express. You'll be followed. The moment you get to Houston, pay off the taxi and rush round to the booking office. Mr. Holmes, this is a bit too thick. My apologies, Mrs. Hudson. Oh. Once again, you've proved yourself far above ordinary women. Well, Mr. Holmes, I did as you told me to. I moved the statue every few minutes, when suddenly the old blooming thing falls on top of me. Yeah, but you've done very well, Mrs. Hudson. Very well. Mr. bring in the prisoner. May I see that, Lestrade? Thank you. That, that's an admirable and unique weapon. Absolutely noiseless. And a tremendous power. Crikey. I knew von Herder, the German mechanic who constructed it to the order of Professor Moriarty. I've known of its existence for some time, but I've never handled it before. Ah, Watson, I've just been murdered. Perhaps you'd like to see who my assailant is. As I thought. But Holmes, that's Colonel Henslow. And what are you charging me with? I, for the attempted murder of Sherlock Holmes, of course. No, 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 Lestrade. I shall not appear in this. Uh, to you. And you alone belongs the credit for this remarkable arrest. Uh, with your usual happy mixture of cunning and audacity, you've, uh, you've got him. Got him? He got who? Well, the man who climbed the tree in the park last night. Uh, a hornbeam, to be correct and shot Ronald Adair through the open window of his flat in Park Lane. Has it occurred to you, Mr. Holmes, that it must be rather difficult to climb a tree and shoot anyone when one only has one arm? Ah, yes, yes, I'd forgotten. Your left arm must be causing you great inconvenience. Yes. Mr. I wonder if you'd be good enough to free it for the Colonel. Hello? What's the game? Let me introduce you to Professor Robert Moriarty. The, the mythical Moriarty, uh, my obsession. <clears throat> I warned you when you called upon me yesterday that sudden impulses were dangerous. I observed that the first molar in your left upper jaw was very badly filled with gold. And when Colonel Henslow was feeling as if he'd lost a son, I observed the same bad workmanship in the same tooth. You clever, cunning swine. You think you've got me in your safe. But you're up against an organization, Holmes. They'll get you. They'll destroy you. <laughs> I might even do it myself. Take him to the station, Mr. Right. Yeah. I think you'll find most of your organization waiting for you there. <laughs> <laughs> 
Also a brand new ceiling, £70,000 of good English bank notes. Take him away. We shall meet again, Mr. Holmes. And next time... Come on. Are you all right? I am, except my feelings and my tie, which is entirely disorganized. Well, we proved our Moriarty theory all right, Mr. Holmes. Mm. It's not easy to throw dust in your eyes, my dear Lestrade. Doesn't do to uh, trifle with Scotland Yard. Quite true, Mr. Holmes. Quite true. Well, now, Watson, what about a drink? You'd like one, wouldn't you? Thanks. Yes, sir. I can't think how you managed to discover these things, Holmes. I saw nothing that could have put you on the track of the murderer. On the contrary, my dear Watson, you've seen everything. Except the tree, which I told you about, but you were unable to make the necessary deductions. I knew about the existence of that air gun. And I found evidence that the tree opposite the flat had been climbed. By issuing a threat in front of Colonel Hensler, I made certain that during the 24 hours he tried to silence me as he'd silenced a bear. It's your little trip to Euston, what? And by placing a bust of myself in the window, which Mrs. Hudson moved occasionally to make it appear lifelike. I, I knew that Moriarty couldn't resist such an opportunity. But what gave you the idea, Mr. Holmes? Uh, oh, Colonel Hensler himself. Yes, in the conversation I had with him, the irrelevant one about tigers, Watson. You can always tether a goat as a bait and wait till the tiger comes. Of course. But what about the sleeping canoe? Hey, Godfrey's made a state of the sleeping cardinal. That's the painting in the room in which you were tied up, Watson, and through which Moriarty used to speak unseen by his duke. Uh, I have only one regret, that the bust of myself by Angelo Palestini has been irretrievably ruined. Really, Mr. Oak? 